we are here today to just um, bring together some gamers some, and some designers uh, around the table to have a conversation about, um, you know, what it means to have representation in the industry and uh, just dig into that a little bit. Uh, I'm excited about this group. Um, it's a few people who I know in the industry and a few people who I don't, so I'm happy to learn about them. And uh, first of all, just I want to thank everybody for coming on the panel and having this conversation today. Um, and I also definitely want to thank Comic Con for this and for this opportunity to just let our voices be heard, because um, I think that's a lot of what this is about. Uh, first, we'll do a few introductions, uh, just let everybody kind of talk about themselves a little bit. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Omar Akil. Uh, I'm the co-founder of a board game publishing company called Board Game Brothers, and we produced uh, our first game, Rap Gods, um, which we have been selling uh, for the most part this year. And uh, that was an exciting adventure that I'll, I'll hopefully get to talk about more. Um, but let's uh, let's jump over to Jason. Hey, y'all. Um, I'm super excited about this panel. My name is Jason Serrato. I'm the co-founder of Horseshoe Games, and uh, I'm the game. I'm the creator of the Army vs. Aliens franchise, and also the designer of Thug Life, the game. Yeah. Next up, uh, can we get Al? Sure. All right. So my name is Al Gonzalez, uh, graphic designer and video editor by trade, uh, game designer by passion and happenstance. Um, this is my current game, Prosperity. It's a game about buying, selling, and trading tea. Uh, but I believe the reason I was called here is my first game, Cantankerous Cats, uh, which is about the um, interesting little situations that we all get into living with an apex predator uh, in the house. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, Kim, how about you? Hi everyone, my name is Camelia Weathers. I go by Kim. I'm also uh, the creator of Brilliant or BS, uh, which is a trivia game that's not really about what you know, but more about what you can make other people think you know. And uh, I'm just really happy to be a part of this panel. Thank you. And Nasha? Hi everyone, I'm Nasha. I'm from Pakistan. Um, Game designer, designed for social justice, kind of trying to bridge the gap between the two. And the game that you see in the background is Arranged. It's about running away from arranged marriages, inspired by my personal life journey. And Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Slauson, a teacher by trade and game designer at night and weekends and all the other free time. Um, I design mostly party games, social games, usually high in creativity um, and self-expression. And last but not least, of course, uh, Perry. Hi, everyone. I'm Perry Clemens. I'm the creator of Inequalityopoly, the board game of structural racism and sexism in America. I am also a teacher by trade and a game designer by passion. I'm really excited to join this panel. Uh, I love I love all the educators. I, I know Perry and Eric personally, and it's just amazing to have educators in the board game space and because we know how great they are as tools. But I don't want to derail us. Um, so uh, the first question, and I'm this is kind of going to softball this question to myself before I open it up to others. Uh, I've been talking about it a lot lately. I've been writing pieces about it. Um, and it's really the, the question that kind of brings us all here. And it's, it's why is representation important in the board game industry right now? Um, and I, I won't go into it too much, but uh, from my own perspective, representation matters um, for so many reasons. For us as designers, I think the important part about representation okay. is really just feeling comfortable in the industry and we know that oftentimes in industries that are majority white um, if you don't see people who are like you there's an uneasiness about going into something and being unfamiliar with it um, and not really having someone to to look up to or to help or someone that you can you can trust um, and you know when we meet people like us who do the things that we do, that's always going to help. But um, I mean, I also think it extends out further than that. I think it, it matters because the games that we produce coming from different areas, coming from different perspectives um, is, is going to be different just based on our experiences. And that's really, I think, something that, that 
I think is important um, for the industry itself too. And I think as we grow, as we have, you know, we want to include more and more people in the community. We all love games and we all think everybody should love games. And the more games we produce that are different, that can resonate with more different people, then the better. Um, I don't, I don't really see any downsides to that. And um, I mean, those are the key things for me. Um, is anybody else uh, would like to jump in and add anything? Um, I, I'll go, go ahead. For it. Yeah. I was going to say um, a lot of what we do um, in, in different times of games is um, somewhat an escapism, you know, where we're adventurers fighting the dragons or we're running some, you know, oil corporation or whatever. Uh, we have this sense of power. Um, so I think um, ha just having, you know, representation on uh, the box art or in the character choices um, allows us to kind of put ourselves in a game, even when we are trying to go for some escapism, you know. Um, it's not super often that, like, the main character of a video game is a person of color or of a comic book or of a movie or, or whatever. So all of these heroes, all of these adventurers, all of these people who own corporations that are normally, like, white dudes. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's hard to kind of uh, put yourself in that role. There's, like, a, a barrier um, there. So, um, and in, in creating these, these, um, these roles of representation, um, you can uh, have some, like, uh, some power roles, you know, um, this is, you know, applies to, you know, things like Captain Marvel or, um, you know, Black Panther, like, the reasons that these movies have hu such huge followings is it's like, mm -hmm. they're giving representation, you can finally see yourself in this role of, of um, hero, um, which I think is cool. Yeah. And Perry, so you're coming from a, a, a slightly different angle into the industry. Um, so how, what does representation mean for you? Well, I mean, it's super important. I mean, it's um, representation also helps people to understand different worlds and different, um, different experiences. And that's really what I try to focus on with my board game is having people understand how the personalized effect of racism and sexism affects someone on a day to day basis. And this whole re representation is super important because it allows people to understand um, other people's experiences. That's, yeah, that's so important. Um, I totally agree. Uh, I want to change the, the direction a little bit, and I want to ask a question to Nashra. Um, and I think um, it, it definitely is a part of representation. Um, you know, we make games that a lot of times we, we make games for ourselves <laughs> for one way or another. <laughs> yes. um, and, and so um, I want to ask Nashra, so ba just based on your game and kind of knowing what it's about, do you feel like games are a good form of just personal expression? 100%. Um, I think I started off my training as an artist and that's a great form of personal representation and then it slowly veered into games because I almost felt like it was even better um, because, you know, it's just it's just so multidimensional that you can express it in so many ways. And as for representation, I think I learned a lot of about that I know about American culture through the TV show Friends and through the board game Cards Against Humanity. But it's like, <laughs> where was that for, you know, um, for South Asia? And that's where I think my games get their inspiration from because it's like, there's an easy way for you to learn the true insider culture. How do you learn that for the culture I'm from? Yeah. Uh, Kim, what about you? Because I know your game is is more of a party game and more about kind of the banter that happens at the table. Um, but do you see that also? It's just like a, a, a personal expression for you to create something like that? Absolutely. You know, and, and one of the reasons why I was inspired to do this game is because um, my, by trade, I work as a, a TV game show producer. So I work, you know, and work on challenges and kind of come up with fun ways to kind of get uh, contestants excited about a challenge, but also make entertaining television. And what I've learned, though, is that, you know, the people that are most successful and aren't necessarily the people that are most talented, but people that are the best in the room. And so I wanted to do a bluffing game because I love bluffing games. I love social deduction games. And I combined that with my love for trivia. And so it really was a, a, a form of uh, expression because it's for me, it's like, you know, I think it's important for people to be able to spot when someone is not being um, 
genuine <laughs> and but do it in a way that is fun and I think it actually teaches people to ask better questions so then I think that's something that's important to me in general yeah yeah uh, what about you Al um, so your games are about tea and cats is that uh, you know part of uh, your expression as well uh, 100% um, also just like circling back to all this stuff um, that people have been talking about uh, games are like probably some of the most effective ways to get other people to understand what it's like to be in a situation because you're inviting them to participate in an activity. Um, and it's a lot different than, you know, say a comic or a film or a novel where it's very passive. You're not involving mm -hmm. uh, the audience. And I learned a lot about that with my time at IndieCade, um, which is kind of circles back to why I did my games. So while my games are very cute and casual, um, there's definitely something that I personally am a designer and trying to say with each game, with Cantankerous Cats, it was um, that one, you can have an adorable theme and have a meaty game behind it because you're basically playing a simplified version of Magic the Gathering um, and trying to teach it to like new people um, and like trying to really hold that new gamer's hands from there's like a baby version of the game that you play with really stripped down rules to the full blown like tournament level uh, version of the game. So it's like, it's really trying to get new people in with, sucker them in with a signal something else, like draw them in with an approachable theme um, that most people wouldn't put any stock into, and then surprise them by like, oh, there's more here. It's not just like, I'm pulling a card and I'm playing it. I'm not just like checking out at the end of the day. There's something here. And more importantly, I can teach my grandma this game. Mm -hmm. And now I can play magic with grandma. <laughs> Um, you know, that kind of approach. And that's what I wanted Cats to be. It was the disarmingly approachable game where, like, you unpack and go, oh, oh, okay, cool. There's more to board games than just, like, pull a card and play a card. Um, yeah. And with Prosperity, um, the thing that I'm trying to say is that it, you want to work together. So, like, the main core of mm -hmm. Prosperity, you're buying, selling, and you're trading tea, but the game is very purposely designed so that you can't be effective on your own, even though it's a competitive game you need to interact with other people at the table and you need to help each other out in order to gain uh, your own resources and in order to give yourself a better leg up. Um, so like, I wanted to convey the message that even though we are, yes, competing, like in this case, you're a tea shop, you are competing to be like the best tea shop in the neighborhood. Um, you're not gonna get there if you don't help each other out. Because otherwise, mm -hmm. if you stay isolated in prosperity, you don't score very much or you have a very difficult time scoring points because you're not being polite. You're not like, you're not cooperating with anybody else at the table. Yeah. Um, so even in games like that, like that's my MO as a designer. I want to, I want to broaden the audience for games, which is why I choose approachable themes. And I want to make simple things that encourage people to think beyond the immediacy of their actions. Um, so it's a, it's a critical skill that we don't really teach people in America through school. Um, but that critical thinking is something that can be taught without having to deal with like the heavy weight of like, oh my God, what am I going to do today? And how do my actions affect five other people? You can just start that journey for a lot of people by saying, hey, we're going to give you a simple thing to do. But in this very uh, innocuous idea of a game, it's going to have like maybe three or four things that are going to impact what you do. Mm -hmm. a few turns down the, the road. Does so, that yeah. Yeah. wrap up my MO? <laughs> it, I mean, it does. And I mean, yeah, we, we have messages that we want to put out in the world. I think that is a part of, of self-expression. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, next, actually, I, I want to change things up a mm -hmm. little bit and um, really kind of talk about our own inspirations for the games that we make. Um, whether it's personal expression or, or what brought you to your game. Uh, and let's, let's kick this one off with Jason. Oh man, can I, would it, um, so I was already getting ready to answer the representation question. Um, so <laughs> um, can I do that? Is that cool? Can I? Yeah, can that's I, fine, can, do it. it. It's funny because being at the end of the line is really interesting because I, I can listen to what y'all are saying and like touch on things that are really evocative to me because um, Eric, you were the first one to, to even mention this, but the idea of um, escapism, I think, is a really big, important talking point when it comes to representation, because when you look at a game box, right, when you see the name of a game designer, um, you don't see color. You see 
knights and fairies and monsters and maybe it's an abstract game. You don't really see, you're, you're free from all that stuff. And I think a lot of us, not all of us, have made these games that can be very polarizing to people because as soon as they see a face that is not a face they're used to, and we're all speaking canon here, so when they see a game, this happened to me, actually happened to me at Gen Con, you see the cover of a game box, there's no white face on it. In our pretty tone-deaf board game industry, that seems to be a problem. And I think it takes people out of their zone and they're suddenly, they don't know what they're, they don't know how to process this information. And I'm not suggesting it's the game designer's responsibility to do it, but I don't think it's off our plate either. Since we're creating portals, I think the really important part is how do you get people to play your game and then how do you make it accessible? Um, mainstream, making it mainstream is a whole other thing. But when it comes to representation, it's super, super difficult because I think a lot of adult gamers are tone deaf to it because, it's, again, it's just they want to forget about the world. They don't want to see what, if a game reminds them of, of, you know, the real streets, that's kind of what they're fleeing from, especially if they're poor gamers, right? But with kids, especially, that's, that's I think, where, that's the thing where the problem is because with children, when they see the faces, they're creating these spaces in their mind, right? And if they don't have that, they don't think about that, they'll grow up to be tone deaf. They won't understand that, that these issues can be a lot more nuanced, a lot more interesting than they were, they were planning for just rolling dice. Yeah. No, that, and that's, that's very real. I think, yeah, the, the difference in perceptions between when you present a, a game that's very different to, to kids are, who are willing to try almost anything yeah. Um, it is very different than the perception that we get presenting games to adults. Um, so uh, yeah, you know, in this industry where your, your market and trying to decide who your market is, we, we have to keep that in, in the back of our heads. Like, how do we approach this? How do we approach adults in gaming? If your game is geared towards adults, um, knowing that these barriers might exist in the way that they process and see and approach games, um, but so yeah, back back to you, Jason. About the is, is that was that part of your inspiration? Were you trying to create um, this, you know, a different world, and and present that? You know, I, I have. I what's funny because when I made Thug Life in particular, I'd already I was kind of writing off at the success of Army versus Aliens. Like that was a really popular title, and it was a mainstream title, right? Target, Walmart, Amazon, crazy amounts of units. I just thought, oh, this is easy game design, right? No big deal. And I had a lot of different directions I went. I, I could have gone. I went with Thug Life because my, my partner at the time, one of my best friends, um, Rob, Roberto Anguiano, he, he's always been drawing these kind of like urban caricatures slash superheroes slash the same thing. And we kind of want to put it all together in a game. But I had a lot of other directions I could go. It was kind of his passion that really inspired me. And I just wanted to make like this snarky, subversive, black and white, representational, art-driven, kind of love letter to the streets, kind of like this urban urban gangster fantasy, you know? And, um, but it, be, it really took on a life of its own and it really positioned itself in the business in a way that I was not expecting or planning. And uh, it was too long a production cycle and we had, you know, you know peaks and valleys. So yeah, it really did take on a life of its own. In terms of representation, that was almost, they tell a writer to write what they know. And I was basically kind of telling like dark street stories from my youth. Um, which I always thought were hilarious, right? You have to laugh at some of this stuff. And the more content we created and the more shows I saw, like, you know, Breaking Bad and, you know, everything else in between The Wire and stuff suddenly started to inform all these gangster movies from my childhood. It really started to over-inform the game, and then it was just kind of, like, off to the races at that point. Nashro, um, yeah, let's mm -hmm. let's dig into your game a little bit and talk about the inspirations there. And and I'm curious about just like the theme in general, but also like some of the gameplay mechanics and, and how you came to those. Right. Um, so essentially, I it's not just me. It's almost every South Asian girl. Uh, we're prepped and primed to from like a very young age be appealing to these matchmakers who we call the Rishta aunties. Um, and essentially everything we do, it's like, you know, it, for example, it's like people using Fair and Lovely, which is a skin whitening cream. Uh, again, that's used in a lot of places in the world. But 
I realized that I personally never wanted to get into an arranged marriage situation. I'm a hopeless romantic at heart. And so I started coming up with creative ways to make myself seem less appealing to these aunties that would be on the lookout. <laughs> so I cut my hair really short, which in Pakistan is a sign of like disrespect or a sign of not being straight or being like in the wrong crowd. Um, I use like tanning makeup to like, so I would firstly darken myself. And then also what I would do is just take that same makeup and draw a proper tan line. So it looked like I was wearing revealing clothes out in public. Um, I wore a fake engagement ring. Like these were all just things that I was doing. I think I was about 22 when I made the game. Oh no, I was 21. Um, and I was supposed to go home that winter break from college. And my parents had the suitor lined up for me to meet. And I was just no way ready for that. I had been buying time, you know, every time I was like, all right, let's wait till I'm 20. Let's wait till I'm 21. They're like, all right, you're 21. This is it. We're not waiting any longer. Um, and I was in this game design class and my professor said, make something that's near and dear to your heart. And I was like, oh, if there's anything, this is it. So I, I was like, my entire life has been kind of like a race to run away from this matchmaker. So that's where the dynamic has to come from. Um, how the game is going to move is by these exact examples. So the girls, so essentially the premise of the game is that there's this one matchmaker who's chasing down three teenage girls and her goal is to get uh, them married to one of those like less than desirable suitors back there. Um and uh, and so the girls are running away from her by drawing from their own deck of cards, which is like scandalous things that they're doing, which are all inspired by things that I had done or things I wish I had done. <clears throat> and then on the other hand, she's getting closer to them by f learning about um, or the good things they've done. So like good, like they're, they know how to make like a perfectly round roti, which is kind of like naan, or they can make the perfect cup of chai, or they're a doctor who wants to be a housewife. So, you know, it's, um, or they have childbearing hips. That's one too. Um, so it's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's like a comedic take on um, everything that we do because it is just ridiculous. And so it is giving you like an inside perspective of what arranged marriages are. And also just showing the, like the ridiculous nuances rather than like what a forced marriage is, which is completely different, but that is what you'll normally see in the media. And the media loves to skew things and just puts in acid attacks and honor killings. And so it was like kind of trying to show the other lighthearted side to it, which is still weird, but there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Perry, tell us a little bit about your inspirations, because um, you are taking a, a more um, sort of or attacking a more serious subject um, in, and I guess not in a particularly lighthearted way. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, a lot of people when first see the game, they think it's not lighthearted, but when you play it, it's actually quite fun and a lot less um, kind of scary as it, it seems. But yeah, I mean, I echo um, Nashra saying, make something near and dear, right? Like when I made this game, I made something about my own experience. And um, I was thinking, I was at this diversity training, maybe my thousandth diversity training. And I was like, wow, this is like really important information, but it's delivered in a way that's really not uh, accessible for everyone in the room. And it's kind of hard in those situations for people to say, what do you mean by this? Or what do you mean by that? So I understand that difficulty. So I was like, as an educator, how can I make something that is really important but not that engaging. It is something that's personalized and educational. And I thought, what game defines America? Monopoly, of course, right? But is right. Monopoly actually represent America? Monopoly is a meritocracy where everyone just, you work hard, you, you know, you do big good deals and you, everyone rises up. But we know that that's not how America is. There's inherent inequities within this world. So I took those and put them all into a game after years of research and, um, put all these data into the game and um, made inequalityopoly. And it was just something that really spoke to my experience. And I had to go even deeper and think about what about the um, experience of a woman, um, a woman of color in America too. So I had in sexism as well, that effect on wealth and um, sustaining wealth in America. And yeah, it's just a really, um, it's, really it's a deep game, but it's also fun, but it's inspired by um, the great um, Lizzie Maggie who um, create the first landlord's game to talk about how capitalism was dangerous to society. And she actually um, made the first Monopoly game. 
and she sold it to um, Buff Parker Brothers for about five hundred dollars and died penniless. And um, this is this game is kind of just a um, extension of that that message. Yeah, yeah. And and so shifting a little bit, do you feel like games are a good method of teaching and instruction? Um, for whether it's a, a, a very serious topic or not, um, do you feel like that's effective? Yes, games are actually a great way to teach difficult to um, topics, specifically polarizing and complex topics like racism and sexism. And um, mm -hmm. as an educator for over a decade, I knew the best way to reinforce something is by making it into the game. Gamifying the experience of being a marginalized group in America makes for a deeper understanding and a richer discussions in a more playful and informal setting. Also, since Inquiry is based on recent national studies, it helps players to learn about these in a very personalized and real way. Mm, yeah. Um, I, I would like you to touch on this, Eric, too, um, because you're also an educator. Um, even though you, you're, it doesn't seem like your games are specifically made to do that, but how do you feel about just using them in, as teaching tools? Sure. Um, well, a lot of my uh, inspiration does come from from the classroom as a, a, a English teacher for for nine years, and um, so I've always been like a huge fan of the arts and self expression, whether it's you know movies or music or graphic novels or video games, like all the uh, different types of art. Um, I've always been a big consumer of, and it was always really important. Uh, for me to give students the ability to experiment with those different forms of self-expression. Um, but a lot of people have like a fear of that. They have fear of creating mm -hmm. things and having it judged. They have um, fear of like, you know, writer's block and um, all those, those the, the scary parts of creating art. Um, so what I have tried to do with um, specifically my game Tattoo Stories um, is you are designing tattoos um, for a customer, and you're trying to combine different elements into, into one uh, tattoo, um, and then sharing it with the rest of the group um, and explaining the idea behind your, your tattoo. So um, my goal for that game was to show people, to give people a safe space to create um, and to draw and to doodle um, these tattoos. Um, so that they could get the experience of um, sharing something that you've made, something that you've created, something that started out as an idea in your head, and then you put it to paper and you, you know, showed it to the world. Um, on a very small micro level, um, I've seen a lot of people, you know, have this experience of, you know, turning their tattoo around and everybody being like, whoa, like, you know, that's, that's crazy. Um, and for people who don't make board games or who don't write or who don't make music or whatever, not everybody gets that experience maybe like ever in life. They've avoided, you know, making anything uh, because they're scared of kind of what people are going to say about it. So um, yeah, I think it's one of my goals is to give people opportunities to see how rewarding creativity can be. Um, monstrosity is a little bit different. It's uh, basically based on um, uh, police sketch artist work um, and witness testimony, uh, but in like a weird sci-fi um, alien men in black kind of universe where you're trying to describe an alien that you saw. Um, uh, so I kind of, uh, it's a silly game. It's really fun. It's really raucous, but um, and probably 20% of the, the plays, we actually get into like a big conversation about like the justice system and like, you know, witness testimony and memory. And even if not at that level, like thinking about your own memories and, you know, um, uh, so I, I just, that was kind of a, a secondary objective for that game was making people think about memory and how our, our brains work and, um, giving them an object lesson and how you can look at something and then look away for 20 seconds and then forget everything that <laughs> you just looked at. So, um, yeah, this is a different, a lot of, uh, I think a lot of us have like these, uh, Al, like you were saying, these light games or these party games, but all of us probably have, you know, one or two little morals or lessons or deeper things that we've mm -hmm. kind of hidden in there um, <laughs> for people. Yeah. Well, and nice. if, I, if I can yeah. piggyback on that for just a hot minute, um, it kind of gets into 
like my favorite MO for educational games. Um, I did a lot of work with an organization called IndieK, their local festival here in Los Angeles for a while. And we have a number of things where it deals with a lot of these heavier topics. Uh, again, because games are a really solid vehicle to create experience. Um, but I found like the genuinely the thing that sticks with people the most is when you try to teach them something and they don't realize that they're learning. Um, so it's, you know, the, my favorite kind of, uh, setup is when, you know, you're playing, for example, like a game about drawing silly monsters or whatever, like you know, monstrosity, and then people don't realize they're actually playing a game that is about how screwed up it is to rely solely on like, you know, imperfect memory to deal with a very serious subject, like, you know, murder suspects or theft subject, things like that. Yeah, sure. Um, and that's what it's, it gets into like, uh, I think it's most effective when you create those aha moments if you're trying to educate something. Because as much as, you know, I appreciate the straightforward approach, I've, I've always seen that it's consistently more effective, especially when people are having their, their current values challenged, where you, you pitch them something completely different and seemingly innocuous. And then they get to the end of the experience and realize, oh, this is really about X. And then, then you got them because they, you've, you've gotten them to get this through this whole experience, you know, having fun, enjoying themselves, not realizing that they're being talked to. Mm -hmm. And then they come to the realization themselves and they feel smart instead of feeling <laughs> like they're being like <laughs> lectured. Yeah. Lectured or talked down to or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's yeah. the end of that point. <laughs> I mean, and and that was actually like some of the most brilliant advice that I got about gaming and, and, and game design was that if you are trying to get a message across, um, it the more cleverly you can hide that message, the better. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that that is a, a valid way to approach design. And it, it sort of hit home for me um, actually a piece I wrote for the manifold not too long ago. So I had left some mechanics in my game that um, in in my opinion, kind of felt a little bit like what it's like to be marginalized, um, where the person who um, starts out slightly ahead uh, on the, in this case, on one of the rap resource tracks, um, they just have a better chance of getting the three bonus pickups that are around the track. And there's no mitigation for that at all. If you start out ahead, you're just ahead. Um, and, and you have a better chance. And, and I know that that is a reality um, and something that I deal with on a regular basis as a black man, just knowing that like there are prohibiting factors that exist. Um, and once I actually wrote about that and like highlighted that, um, people really took note and I'm glad that that happened. And I'm hoping, um, Maybe I hit it too cleverly. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, those are those are super valuable. So um, so let's let's have a little a fun little question. Um, All right, if I could, I just want to piggyback. Oh yeah, go ahead, Kim. Yeah, well, I was just saying for the education right, component, that's something as a part of my game that I did not expect and did not intend. But I've had so many um, teachers and professors just reach out to me about how they've been using my game as like a social justice component in their classrooms because our game is all about you know, figure out who actually knows the answer to a trivia question and who's just pretending to know the answer. And so people have to explain themselves, explain how or why they know it without giving away, you know, the answer itself. And as, as the judge, you get to interrogate all the players to kind of figure out who actually knows it. And almost, I would say like 90% of the time, if it's a sports category question, the judge will almost never give it to a woman, right? They'll always assume mm -hmm. the males in the room are better at at uh, knowing this first question, even if, if as a woman, I'm given an excellent you know, explanation, like I have a friend who works at a sports network and she will never, they never give her the brilliant card and she's the expert in the room, right? And so they will always assume that the male is better. And so I think that's something that I did not intend, but it really shows us kind of like how our personal experiences, our backgrounds kind of frame how we think about how, what we think about other people. And yeah. so even when you think about a criminal justice system, like you can't, those are certain things that you just can't take out of the picture when you're factoring in, you know, this idea of like truth, right? It's like, you know, your truth, you know, this is my, this is my husband. 
I know him, I live with him. So if he tells me he knows the answer, I believe him, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, it's this, this, this component that I think is very exciting that I didn't expect or intend for my game to have. And it's actually something that's like, you know, I really want to push forward even more. Oh yeah, hundred percent. People bring their baggage with them <laughs> yeah. when they come play your game. <laughs> You're, you're not going to be able to do anything to stop that. Like, um, I totally can I jump in here. Um, I totally agree with this about the um, educational parts into the game. But as you see with my game, I didn't hide any of the educational parts. <laughs> in your face, there it is. You, you better learn about this and this and this when we come yeah. in. And yeah. um, that's how I liked it. And um, but uh, there's a good thing about the game is people get to learn their like the details of like how maternity leave affects um, um, the gender pay gap how promotions, how raises, how presidential complex, how all these things affected on a micro level affect your whole long-term life. Um, and um, it also challenges people's assumptions because there's always this, this kind of model minority thing, this idea where it's like, oh, well, this person made it. This person made it at the projects. How can't you? Yeah. We need to work harder. And within the game, there are, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a probability. So it's not like you're guaranteed to not become wealthy as a white, as a black person in America, or as a woman in America, it's just less likely. It's just uh, your odds are against you over and over and over. And you either get really lucky to actually um, get some sort of equality. So, I mean, that's just a really important thing to put in there. And um, I think that when people are playing the game, they know <laughs> they're learning and the discussions they have are, um, really enlightening because they are they to see oh my goodness this has happened to me and they get to see how the reaction is too when someone goes to jail in the in the game you see this opportunity i can get that person's property now i can buy this thing now now i have uh, another customer i have another renter he's mar they're marginalized so i can exploit them and yeah. that's what happens in capitalism and very much what happens within the game so and within the game you'll see how people react to that and extrapolate that to real life, to seeing someone else um, get stricken with some, you know, um, sadness, some tragedy in their life. Some people in the capitalist society see that as opportunity. It's always yeah. seen as opportunity for someone else to make some money. Yeah. Harry, I want to yeah. play your game really bad right now, and <laughs> probably not as much as I want to play, show you how to play Thug Life. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll, just, I'll just say yeah, similar. <laughs> uh, well, let's let's yeah do a quick um, just because our viewers are are going to be interested in this one. Uh, just let us know what your favorite game is. Um, so I'll start, and I it's funny I say a different game every single time somebody asks me my favorite <laughs> game because I have a lot of favorites. Uh, this time I'm actually going to go at Arboretum. Um, super well, simple little game. Just it's about it's about trees um, and trying to build a path. And it's colors and numbers so elegantly designed. The rules are pretty straightforward. Um, but this game is absolutely cutthroat, and it, it it defies all that you see on the table to have just these pleasant, gorgeous artwork and trees laid out, um, and just feel the kind of intensity in your decision making. Uh, so that's mine. Um, yeah, Jason, what, what do you got? Um, I'm the same as you, man. It, it's, it's a moving target, but I'm gonna, just gonna throw this out there right now, probably because I haven't played it enough recently, but I'm gonna say Rising Sun. And, oh. and you know, you know prop, prop, props to my boy Eric Lang, but really I think the Rising Sun is kind of a, it combines all the aspects of a lot of crunchy euros that I love, but in a tight little package. Um, plus the Asian theme, like, you know, Asian spiritualism of, of, ev of every variety is kind of my jam. And then miniatures, and then, you know, accessible Euro mechanics. So yeah, that's like the complete package for me. Nice. And what about you, Nasha? Um, again, I think maybe all of us will have the same answer with that. It's always a moving target. <laughs> depends on like the phase of life I'm in. Uh, but I will say it's it's my childhood favorite. It's a game called Ludo, which is very similar to Purchisi. Um, and so e there's four players. Each one has four tokens, and they have to kill someone along the way and go home. Mm -hmm. And it is like the monopoly of Pakistan. People like throw over the board. Will fight because of it. And ever <laughs> since. Ever since COVID, everyone has moved to the app version. So I'm keeping in touch with my friends and family in Pakistan by playing Ludo with them. So we just have a WhatsApp group where someone will text like Ludo and whoever is free will hop on the app. <laughs> That's so good. Uh, Kim? Uh, yeah, I think right now my favorite game would be uh, Blockbuster. 
which essentially it's a game where it's you have to um, you have different cards that have different names of movies on them and you have to try to get your team to guess the movies but you, there's you have to choose different categories one is like you can only say one word to try to get your team to guess it the other one you have to try to act it out um, and then I can't remember the third one right now, but it's, it's basically for my friends, group of friends, like we love movies and we love television and it allows us to incorporate all the different artistic creative sides of ourselves by trying to get you to guess this, by, by having this like limitation to it. So that's definitely one of my favorites right now. Yeah. Uh, Eric. Um, mine uh, actually is kind of always the same um, answer. Uh, <laughs> it usually surprises people. Uh, my favorite game is uh, Happy Salmon. Um, uh, I've yeah. bought probably 20 copies of this game uh, to give as gifts and to um, introduce people to the hobby. Um, I love it because it kind of challenges what a game can be. Um, there's a physicality aspect to it. Um, I think that it does some really interesting things with um, uh, like not only physicality getting you up and moving, but there's also like touch, your fist, which isn't great right now, but in other uh, <laughs> times, uh, you know, your fist bump and your high five and you're doing a little happy salmon thing. Uh, you're switching places with people at the table. Um, the game takes probably a minute to play um, and uh, people always want to play again and people get really competitive about it. Um, but it was one of my early experiences of just having my mind blown by a game um, because there's no mm. board, there's no like, you know, I don't know, reverse and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. It's just, it's an experience um, and it goes over well. Every time I play it, show it to people, people always buy it. Um, it's great for kids and even better for adults because I think it gets us out of our, um, you know, you gotta be serious, you gotta be an adult, you gotta, you know, not laugh and and run around and all that kind of stuff so um yeah it just it just does so many interesting things uh with with kind of breaking some some weird social norms about being an adult um but also while being very very fun and silly <laughs> yeah uh al what about you um yeah again same moving target but <laughs> i've got two for very different reasons right now cheater um, cheater yeah, so <laughs> it's gonna be like half an answer. Uh, Sulkin is probably my favorite big board game. Um, Jason knows this, he played it with me a few times. Um, but I like it because um, it feels the most like a civilization video game to me, which is one of my, my favorite genres. Um, and it does, it's a, it's a mildly crunchy Euro. It's like you're still, you still have to think, you still have to do the whole like, you know, what you do now is gonna have consequences three or four turns later. And I think it's the best implementation of thought over time that exists in the board game space. Because, like, um, the whole center of the, the fulcrum of the game is this calendar, the Mesoamerican calendar that sits in the middle of the table. And, you know, my fan is, you know, part Aztec and Mexican, so that also made me happy. Um, but the cogs turn, and um, you don't just place and remove your workers like another game. You place your worker, and then you have to wait. And you have to wait if you want the thing that you want. Um, and then you decide how early to pull them. So it's always this balance of like immediate gratification of what am I gonna do this turn, next turn, versus trying to plan out what's gonna happen five or six turns down the road. Um, and the game, uh, it just has like a multiple paths to victory. It does everything really well, super smooth. It's very elegant. Um, may I make a game half as elegant one day? Um, and then another one is Splendor, which is a similar thing, but very small experience. Um, Splendor, I like it because you can teach it in five minutes, you can play it in 30, but you have to play it like, you know, a dozen times to really understand how to play the game well. Um, and when you have a bunch of people in the same room, both of those games that know the game really well, it gets very competitive and contemplative. Um, and, uh, but engaging, it's like, you have a bunch of people, it's like chess, you're sitting around the table doing this, but you can't look away. You can't just like put your, pick your phone up and do whatever because you might miss what someone else is doing. So it's very like attention grabbing. I, I do love some Splendor. Splendor is a fantastic <laughs> game. <laughs> I've played probably a hundred times at least. Uh, Perry, what about you? Yeah, so um, I mean, as an educator for over like 10 years, a lot of my favorite games are games I've played in my classroom to educate um, my students. Um, and. Before I started working on this board game, um, I didn't know about this whole indie 
gaming community. I mean, I'm so glad to be part of it now, but I didn't know about all these games. And I haven't got a chance to play a lot of these games. I, uh, except for Rap Gods, the great Rap Gods. But um, I um, really want to play all these. I'm writing these all games down to try to um, play them one day. They sound really fun. But for me, my personal games, no moving target, Monopoly and Scrabble. As a kid, I loved playing Monopoly, obviously. And I love playing Scrabble with my family, even though I always win, even though I was the youngest. It's awesome. Um, but yeah, those are my games. I just love them. I just love the of Scrabble. I love the words and playing them together and Monopoly. I love the competitiveness of, and the capitalist nature of it as a kid. Um, but I'm looking forward to playing a lot of these games. Nice. All right. Uh, I, I want to talk to you. Um, and, and Kim, this one will be for you. Um, how do you, I, I want Eric to touch on this too, um, but how do you approach making games? You know, we're talking about representation, right? And, and that's in the games themselves, but realistically, we kind of make games that have to appeal to everyone, um, or ideally they appeal to everyone. So both of you are working uh, and have been working on party games. What's your approach to design games that can be fun for anybody to play? Yeah, well, uh, for me, I think starting with Brilliant BS is the only game I've created. And it really stems from my love of two things, trivia and bluffing games. <laughs> and so I really wanted to bring those two worlds together because when I play with my friends, that's what those are games that we gravitate towards. I think it's because we like tricking each other. I don't know. We just like uh, trying to outsmart and outwit each other. And so we would, uh, you know, we play games and a lot of them, a lot of bluffing games are anonymous. But I wanted to make something that was, you know, I have to be able to look you in the face and be able to convince you of something if I'm not telling the truth, you know? And so that was something that I wanted to add, like, my own spin to it. And I think when I, when I was designing, it was really like what could, like we talked about, it comes from our own personal expression, but also we make games for ourselves. It's like we want to make a game that we would think we would have fun playing and that my friends would have fun playing. So that was an inspiration for it. And, you know, in, in developing and marketing the game, I had a couple of options. It was, you know, I decided, do I want to keep this general trivia, general knowledge trivia? Do I want to make this a black culture game? You know, because I think it, there are certain things that are aspects that are unique to our community as well. And I really wanted to do something that I thought would be broad enough for everyone to enjoy that would have a little bit more uh, success widely. But I don't, I don't, but it was never an intention to say, I want to make this mainstream or make it, you know, uh, I, I wanted to make it accessible, but I just really wanted to make something that I knew that I could be proud of and that I wanted to play. I think that, that's important as artists. You know, we, it, it takes so much energy and effort from us to design something, to publish something, to crowdfund for this, this source was there, to market, to put it out there, to try to get into retail. So you have to be passionate about it. And it has to be something that you, you enjoy if you're going to do so much, because we, we are artists, you know, we're not making films or TV, but we are artists in that, in that way that we are putting our own, you know, we're expressing something, putting that out into the world. So that was the most important thing for me was just like, make something that I loved and that my friends would love and want to play yeah well and what about um, you eric or not yeah. if you want to jump could in, i ju could i jump oh, yeah, in so it. that i can then say my goodbye as well because yes we're off. gonna lose you it's very sad <laughs> yeah sorry <laughs> oh sorry um but yeah i think for me generally the most important thing even with arranged with the other game that i've made which is like paltering politicians about pakistani politics it's something that is inspired it's it's honestly both of them started as a way for me to vent my own anger but also just like make something funny out of it so i wouldn't be as angry anymore um but that's where the two started and right we so i want to thank you again for being here for sure if you want to find arrange purchase it view more pictures of it um you can go to my website which is www.nashra.co n-a-s-h-r-a it's a hard name <laughs> All right. Bye. Great. Thank you so much. Bye. It's nice Thank to meet you. you. Bye. -bye. Nice you as well. You. Bye. I want to go buy all those games now. <laughs> <laughs> See ya.